Initiative. I just want to thank all of you for joining us today uh, and welcoming our, our guest speaker, Bruce Furlock. Um, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this webinar series, and then I'd like to introduce Dr. Spurlock. Uh, the Inquiry Program partnered with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation in 2007 to create a medication management um, uh, seminar that we hosted at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton, and it brought together researchers with stakeholders to talk about the issues surrounding medication management and medication errors. And we've continued that partnership by uh, bringing forward a series of webinars that started last fall and have continued through the spring, uh, all of which are available on our website at www.inqri.org. Um, Dr. Sorlock was a member of that original group uh, and, and spoke about Beacon uh, in Princeton, and I'd like to introduce him. He is the President and CEO of Convergence Health Consulting Incorporated, a boutique management consulting firm committed to leading improvement in healthcare. Dr. Sparlock works with physicians and healthcare executives to create state-of-the-art clinical management programs using his experiences as a leader in California Quality Initiative and operational expertise in change management, performance improvement, physician relations, medical staff issues, peer review, and patient safety. He helps organizations create results-oriented programs in a variety of domains. Dr. Sparlock is executive director and chair of the Chart Board, a groundbreaking initiative of hospitals, purchasers, health plans, and consumer groups to produce a voluntary standardized hospital performance report in California. He also leads large multi-participant quality collaboratives in California, Washington, and Florida, designed to accelerate the implementation of evidence-based clinical practices in large regions. Currently, he is an adjunct associate professor with Stanford University. He is a nationally known speaker on healthcare topics ranging from healthcare trends to redesigning specific operational units. Now, before I turn it over to Dr. Sparlock, I just wanted to uh, uh, speak for a moment about the way that this webinar will be conducted. It's a little different than some of our previous ones. Um, as you may have noticed on your screen, you, we are now viewing Dr. Spurlock's uh, desktop, uh, and this is because of the nature of his presentation. We want to make sure that you don't miss out on the media uh, that he's included. So uh, that's why the setup looks a little bit different. Also, we're going to uh, stick with the premise of, you know, making sure that everyone has time for questions at the end, but uh, before we get to that portion, we're going to keep the phones on mute just to kind of keep down the, the background noise, but we will definitely have time for your questions. Uh, as, after this session, we are going to make the presentation available uh, on www.inqri.org, so you can view it again, or you can uh, pass it along to your colleagues and friends, which we hope you will do. That said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Spurlock. Thank you very much, Heather, and I want to be uh, just very appreciative and grateful for the opportunity to speak to this group. It's a great uh, August group, and uh, it was fun meeting many of you back in Princeton a couple of years ago, uh, and, and it's glad to be able to be on this call again. I also want to thank the inquiry staff, uh, Heather and Megan, and the others that work on the project for all the great work they're doing, um, helping us to learn from each other, to share tools. I get the emails, and, and I know many of you go and uh, look at the tools, look at the things that are being shared across the different projects, and it's just fantastic to see uh, many of the things that are going on and also the, the, the work across patient safety and, and quality and healthcare. I also want to thank uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for their support of the project, and a special plug and thanks to uh, my friends at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, they are our primary funders for the Beacon Collaborative, and more than just funders, there are intellectual partners. We spend many hours talking about this whole notion of improvement at scale. We spend a lot of time thinking about exactly how to make this more effective. And so it's a great partnership with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and very grateful for the opportunity to share some of what we've learned over the past five years in the Beacon Collaborative. Let me just make one caveat before we get started on uh, this whole notion of collaboration and what it means to improve quality and safety at scale. Um, this is about medication management, the series is, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about medication management. We have done two major projects in the Beacon Collaborative on medication management. So we worked as part of the 100,000 Lives campaign that the IHI hosted. Uh, we worked on medication reconciliation, just like many hospitals across the country did, and we learned a great deal from that. We also worked on a series of high-risk medications um, that I know many places had some experience with dealing with that. And we, we thought we had a lot of uh, significant progress. 
Uh, the challenge with medication management, as many of you know, is just, you know, counting and, and, and measuring our success. And so we've had challenges with that. We actually wor worked on a project where we used the IHI medication trigger tool to try to be able to more effectively uh, measure improvement on that. And we found some um, strengths and weaknesses of the tool and have been using that. But because it's hard to measure at scale on a, uh, with a tool like that, we've been uh, mostly focusing on other areas in addition to the medication management. And I'm going to show you some of the results of that today. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that um, I'm not going to spend much time um, talking about medication management, but the Beacon Collaborative and the 39 hospitals in the Bay Area have been actively working on those topics, just like many of you uh, across the country. So let me give a little bit of context setting and background about Beacon, what it is we do and who we are. And I know many of you have heard this before when we talked at Princeton, but for those of you who are new or those of you who have never heard of Beacon, let me just describe it. It actually, it's interesting. We're now 37 hospitals. We've had uh, a couple of hospitals that have sort of counted as two campuses and one hospital, and so now we're at 37 hospitals. Uh, and we cover five of the 10 Bay Area counties that are funded by the Gordon Benny Moore Foundation. So there's about 30 other hospitals that um, currently are not active participants in the Beacon um, Collaborative in the Bay Area, but we're actually going to be expanding, and I'll talk about that in a second. Our focus is predominantly in the acute care arena. Uh, we have not branched off into the ambulatory care or long-term care, or home health, those kinds of uh, um, health care uh, uh, locuses for uh, care, but we've been mostly looking at the hospitals and, and the acute care area, and it's predominantly been on the patient safety uh, area. So, uh, you know, we, we could go broadly and actually toyed in this notion of operations with flow and a couple of areas, but the, the major focus has been on quality and patient safety. As I mentioned, we've been in existence for about five years, and we're considered basically a regional learning network. We've done a, a variety of interventions and a variety of different topics, and we basically have the same players at the table. So we've become, instead of just, you know, a collaborative that starts and, and a year and a half or two years later stops, we've been the same group that's been together for about five years, and it's been fun to see the relationships develop, the sharing that's gone across uh, institutions and across the region. It's just been an exciting opportunity. And finally, we're really focused and based on this notion of peer-to-peer -peer learning, and I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about that. But it's not a research community, although some people have done research in our area. It's really about learning from each other on implementation of best practices throughout the area. Here's a, a picture of the uh, hospitals in the, the, in the Bay Area. And as I said, we, uh, we've kind of now gone from 39 to 37. We had a hospital close and, and be reopened under the auspices of another hospital. And the two-campus uh, hospital that was initially separate is now being reported out of one. So we, we really have 37 hospitals. And I mentioned that we are in this growth phase. As of the first of the year, we got some additional funding from Anthem Blue Cross to add on uh, other areas in California to the great work at Beacon and the Southern California Patient Safety Collaborative. And so now we're getting hospitals in the Monterey and, and what we call border counties to uh, see if they want to participate in Beacon, and so far we're seeing a great uptake uh, in the interest in joining in the collaborative on an ongoing basis. Um, our programming is, is really relatively simple. Like many, we have in-person meetings, and that's really the core of it. We have quarterly in-person meetings. The topics vary, and the topics vary based on performance, based on what we're hearing from the field that people want to, to learn about, and we don't necessarily do every topic every, every quarter. So uh, right now we currently have uh, eight major interventions that are going on at the same time, and several of them will be on um, three or four of the meetings a year we'll be doing, but most of them will not be having uh, content and programming for each of those quarterly in-person meetings. We have a monthly webinar, and sometimes we uh, move that around, and so we might have two in a month and one in another month or, or, or none in some months, but we try to approximate about every month where we get together and we go into more depth in a single subject, and this tends to be a much more interactive deep dive into a topic. We have affinity groups, and this was a new addition over the past year and a half, where we get people that are in single areas. So we've got the infection control uh, practitioners, right now the infection preventionists, and we have uh, the stroke coordinators that get together and talk about their subjects in a, sometimes in an in-person setting and mostly by phone to really, again, uh, develop that networking coordination across folks that, that really may not have interest. For example, the stroke coordinators don't have a whole lot of interest in sepsis or hospital-acquired infections, and so it gives them another opportunity to get together, share what they're learning, and understand how they can improve. The Beacon Institute is really our training uh, factory. So 
we learned early on that it's really important to go into the details on practical ways to implement uh, the, the evidence-based best practices for, for an intervention like VAP or central line infection. But we also sort of from a strategic standpoint two years ago added on this notion that we want to get deeper into the organization and have a greater breadth and people understanding the basics of change management. So we have a practical skills for quality improvement class that we teach on a monthly basis. Uh, 30 to 50 people attend that, and that's an introduction to quality concepts, to the model for improvement, and just how we think about quality. So this is trying to get more people in the hospital engaged in this notion of quality improvement, understanding this notion of small tests of change. And then we have a four-part um, compass program where we get team leaders and project leaders together to talk about how we can take it a little bit more advanced. How do you, how do you actually run meetings effectively? How do you go into more depth in the model for improvement? Can you use Excel as a way to both capture and display data in an effective manner? And we actually have them teach uh, the model for improvement on the last day as sort of a, uh, a graduation ceremony. Uh, we also have a couple of other programs that we've taught in the Beacon Institute that have been sort of general in nature. So one was on, we called it Hop on the Bus, Gus, the Myths and Mysteries of Engagement, where we had uh, this notion of how to engage the frontline staff, physicians, leaders, and the, and the financial organizations uh, uh, that we work with. We have a website and listserv that serve as a repository and a way for people to communicate. And we have two improvement advisors that provide um, support both by phone and on site to the hospitals as they are working through these different interventions. A new technique that we had, and this is part of the reason we're using this um, method for a display, is because we just started uh, with uh, video-based educational tools. And this is one that I thought I'd share, just a real brief clip of one that we published uh, just recently, and we've had an incredible number of hits. We've had over 3,000 hits from all across the world, from China, from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Europe, South America, uh, to see this, and now the National Patient Safety Foundation wants to play uh, this uh, video at their annual meeting next month. So let me just play a real quick clip from this uh, happy video that we, we published about two months ago. I am Pat Kepke, and we're on location at St. Louis Regional Hospital with the Beacon Top 40 to hear this week's number one single, Turn the Patient. You won't stop turning after you hear this one. Welcome to St. Louis Regional Hospital. Patients on the mattress all day long. Chasing and creeping their skin. Well, that's wrong. You can make a difference in a big, big way. Set your clock for every hour here. Turn the patient. 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 Keep an hour happy. So if you're interested in seeing the rest of that video, you can go to our website at www.beaconcollaborative.org. And we found that uh, folks across the country and eventually across the world now are using that to help their staff work on hospital-acquired pressure ulcers. And it's just been a fun thing to do, and we're, we're going to be branching out on the number of videos that we produce to help people um, find ways to improve and to generate some uh, free decor and momentum within the organization. Um, so. I always put this slide in here to remind me uh, about Beacon, and this is a really good example of the people that come to our meetings, the really dedicated clinicians from across the region, and they are the ones really doing the work. All we do is kind of put them together and give them a forum that they can share their ideas and talk with each other and help them, um, you know, be able to accelerate their improvement. They're the ones doing all the hard work, and we, you know, look like we're taking the credit for it, but I really want to make sure everybody understands it's really not us, it's all of these folks and the folks that they serve and work with at their own institutions. It's the frontline people and the leadership teams at those locations that, that provide all the great work. So that's a little bit of a background on Beacon and what we do and how we try to accomplish things. Let me go to a, a little bit broader question that I think we're uh, asking and, and sort of what we think about. And so the question is, how do you implement evidence-based practices faster than standard diffusion? 
And that was really the sort of genesis for why we even created Beacon in the first place. What is it that collaboration does that may be faster than if we just let it go on its own? And I think one of the things that we've dealt with, that many of you have dealt with, is this notion that you know data makes uh, clinicians move, that without data they're not going to make any movement. And we actually think that there's a, a fair amount of myth to that. It doesn't mean that data is not important, but just showing folks the data is probably not going to be all that effective. And part of it's because there's just so much data to know. So there's been 18 million Medline articles since 1948, just an absolute explosion on the number of uh, you know, data sources available. And the increase in the number of medical journals has been exponential. So every month there's just a, a new medical journal and a new subspecialty that needs to uh, be vet, viewed and read and digested and then disseminated. There was a study that was done back in 2000 that looked at natural diffusion of new evidence, and they estimated that on average it takes 17 years to reach clinical practice. So we put the picture of the librarian in, in the side, and not to make any diss on the librarians, but our notion is that uh, if data were the ones to rule the world, we would have solved the problem a long time ago. Clearly, it's important to know what evidence-based practices are, although we're even challenging some of those uh, because we're finding that people are making improvements without clear evidence of a practice to work on. And pressure ulcers is a classic example I'll show, talk about in just a minute. So here's a slide we put together on a specific example of how long it takes from the evidence of the well-established sort of leading article that created uh, the rationale for doing a practice and how long we really saw it as adoption and, and current performance. The on admission for AMI, the ISIS II study came out in 1988. And as of, of 2008, we had a performance of 94% based on CMS reporting across the country. So just a huge length of time. Antibiotics within 60 minutes of surgery, the class and article in 1992, wasn't adopted as best practice nationally until 2005. And again, as of about a year ago, it was 86% uh, implementation. So a long time from when these articles first come out, when we really think there's strong evidence for doing a practice from when they're actually implemented across the way. So our answer is this notion of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And we think that it's not so much the evidence, but the implementation of a practice that really is the challenge to this whole phenomenon. So let me give you a classic example. Um, we talk about the VENT bundle. So these are the four um, practices that have been shown to reduce ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, it was uh, published and promoted by the IHI in the 100,000 Lives campaign. And actually implementing them is a little more difficult than it thinks. And one of the ones you think these simple is the head of the bed elevated for 30 degrees for patients that don't have contraindications if they're on a ventilator. And, um, you know, we talked with a lot of folks, and we went through early days of how to make sure this happens reliably, 100% of the time for every patient on a regular basis. And patients um, need to be turned. They need to be bathed. They need to be repositioned. They need to eat. They need to um, have medications given. And so they're continually changing positions. And it's just human nature that the nurses and the staff would forget to put the head of the bed back up and patients will go long periods of time. So one of the ways to do it is to go ask administrators just exactly how should we be solving this problem. And smart administrators would say, you know, there's got to be a bed with an alarm that when the head of the bed goes below 30 degrees, we get an alarm that goes off and, um, and we can remember to put it back up. That's a simple, you know, cueing from an alarm system. The challenge with that is that obviously alarms, uh, people are attenuated to that. And more importantly, the cost is really very, very prohibitive to put that in a 12-bed ICU, which is typical for our institutions. So um, a smart frontline nurse said, well, what if we put a piece of red tape on the wall? And when the head of the bed is below the piece of red tape, you see that, and that's a reminder that you need to elevate it above that. And we spread that you know, practice, that implementation practice, through uh, the collaborative, and it went like wildfire. And suddenly, people were able to very rapidly hit their um, implementation practices of 100% by doing that. In fact, one hospital took it to the next level and said, well, better than our piece of red tape, what if we put a picture of the CEO um, behind there so that when the patient's head of the bed is down, you get to see the picture, and it scares you so much, you put it back up. So a really kind of fun way to talk about how do we do that. And we learn that from frontline peers, and they teach each other very effectively. So the question with peer-to-peer uh, collaboration and sharing is our people are going to compete or collaborate. We actually think this is kind of a false uh, false uh, distinction, that you can actually do both competition and collaboration. And what you really need to understand is what are the motivations for the participating hospitals to do both. And in the Bay Area, we have very, uh, very effective and very powerful healthcare systems. So we have the Sutter System, Kaiser, Catholic Healthcare West, the Daughters of Charity. We also have two major tertiary care centers with the University of California, San Francisco, and Stanford University, 
and then some public hospitals and a variety of independent hospitals, very, very aggressive, looking for increasing their market share, increasing the number of services that they provide. They're trying to get their reputation. We have a lot of billboards around, all around, that highlight some of the great successes they had. And so they're trying to very much compete on reputation and public image. And with the nursing shortage that was uh, so powerful when we first started this, there was no question there was a competition for recruiting high-performing high, uh, staff. And that competition still goes on, even though we've seen a sort of attenuation of the shortage problem. It goes on with physicians and with other uh, clinicians, like pharmacists, where we still have issues of shortage and challenges. So there's no quest question that our hospitals are going to compete with each other, but we found ways that they can collaborate. And one of the great ones, and this was sort of the aha we had with the Beacon Collaborative, was they can, they can collaborate on patient safety. You know, it's just going to be very few people that are going to put their central line infection rates up on a billboard, or they're going to put um, their MRSA infections, or the number of medication errors they, they put upon to be able to compete with other folks. So we found a real big openness to this uh, notion. We found that they also will we'll collaborate when there are regulatory mandates that have come down from either the state or the federal government. And so lots of practices on how do we make sure that we're going to meet joint condition standards, how are we going to meet state or uh, national um, compliance issues is, is been able to do that. And one of the kind of new areas that have been explored is this notion of a common. So um, the Bay Area has nurses that travel between different facilities and patients that travel between just different facilities, much like urban centers around the country. And so there's this notion that, um, that yes, there are patients, but they may be somebody else's patient, or they may be my father, and, and the father, my father goes to two different hospitals. So this notion of a commons has really been developed, and I think the notion about a regional identity that's happened in the San Francisco Bay Area has been pretty powerful. Uh, at the center of our techniques for you know, implementing this peer-to-peer -peer learning is the folk getting the folks together and just letting them talk about it to each other. And they, they talk about their failures just as much as they talk about their successes. And we get the early adopters to help bring on the, the, you know, the late adopters into the whole process uh, so that really everybody has something to offer to each other. We share tools, and one of the early things that we learned was when somebody brought a protocol or when they brought a data collection tool or some other mechanism that helped somebody, we, we would pass it around really quickly. And this included posters and, and all sorts of marketing devices as well. We share implementation strategies, so how do you get the docs to do certain things? And that was really effective, partly because um, they were, they were semi-competitive. So if the hospitals would say, well, this doc, uh, the docs in the hospital down the street are doing this, why can't we do it? It seemed to be able to stimulate more adoption, and that was that soft competition we call, um, in addition to collaboration that makes this work. There's no question that the sense of trust emerged over the first couple of years in the Beacon Collaborative. And now people call each other all the time without having the collaborative or the listserv or anything else to, to, to get support. And this has gone beyond the walls of Kaiser and Sutter and CHW and other, other system hospitals. They now call their friends and their neighbors across the bay and across different institutions. So it's kind of neat to be able to do that. And as I mentioned, we do provide a support structure and some of the tools and ways for this whole uh, process to hopefully be accelerated. And, and we sort of think we've got it down to a couple of pieces of magic. There's really three different things that we think are important. And you know, you'll hear me say this one time, you'll hear me say it a thousand times. It's best for folks to hear it from their peers. It's interesting. When we bring experts or when I say something, um, you know, it's great. But when the messenger says exactly the same thing and it looks like them in the same kind of position, it's so much more powerful. We find people retain it better. We find people pay more attention to it. So there's something about the messenger and giving it. Uh, we use experts to inoculate. They come in and they sort of give us the first ground, ground of why the evidence is the way it is, but we quickly move off of what's the research and what's the evidence and, quick, and very much on to how do we implement it? How do you overcome that? How do you get your physicians to participate? What did the nurses do when they first pushed back on this and how do you, you know, overcome those challenges? Because people are at different stages, we have this motto that all teach, all learn, that everybody has something to gain and everybody has something to share. And so we'll often put people on a webinar who may be not top of the class that have shown a dramatic improvement to have them share what their improvements are so that everybody gets a chance to be able to, um, to teach each other and so there doesn't feel like there's a sense of there's an elite class in our group. And we have borrowed from the IHI uh, this notion that Jim Conway talks about stealing shamelessly. So there is this thing that, you know, we just, just give these things out and nobody has proprietary nature to them and we're just going to borrow from each other. We do talk about modifying or tweaking tools 
that make your individual organizations um, adopt them more more easily. But really, this whole notion of scale seamlessly is really a mo motto that we live in and use on a regular basis. Our focus is on practical information, so we rarely do theoretical kind of things. We really just keep away from theory altogether. There's a lot of theory that's fine, so we use cold learning theory to think about how we put uh, put information together in our meetings and our webinars. But really, we try to keep that away from the folks. It's really about the how-to, how-to, as Mary Beth Sharp called it from the Moore Foundation, in a highly interactive area. And we really just say this is all about implementation. We're not going to go back and really debate the literature unless there's an important um, modification that we need to deal with and understand. And this happens in our sepsis bundles with some of the ap applications in um, the um, in the 24-hour bundle, but I'll talk about that in a second. The other part we think is really crucial is that it's a regional in nature. And so it's great to hear the work that's done in the East Coast or in Michigan or in Florida or somewhere else, but it's something about the hospital down the road that makes people pay more attention. And we think it's this sort of soft competition notion that it's, you know, got the competitive spirit, but not so competitive that they're not willing to, you know, keep these things close to the vest and they're willing to share and do it. And we use local examples in the vast majority of cases. Every once in a while, especially early on, we bring in an outside person who may have, you know, knocked the ball out of the park when we're getting a, an initiative off. But in general, we try to really keep it focused on the people they've been seeing and just exactly to demonstrate the fact that if they, this hospital can do it and overcome the hurdles, then most of the hospitals in the group we, uh, that are participating can as well. And then we track our progress, and I'll show that in a second. So I just wanted to make sure as I just sort of get ready to change gear and talk about the progress we've had in Beacon, uh, the fact that we're not the only place that has accidents, and, and I have lots of these pictures and examples from across the country where um, safety is an issue that it goes beyond just healthcare. So let me just share a couple of um, slides on our, our actual progress that we've made. And we started um, with BAP and central line bloodstream infections right at the very beginning, part of the 100,000 Lives uh, campaign. And for the first part of we, we were just worried that we weren't sure if people were going to actually get together and collaborate and share and open up and tell their stories and their ways of being successful. So we didn't ask for data. And about six months into it, we had a meeting and said, you know, we think we'd do better if we had data. And the group said, definitely, we want to share data. Uh, that was challenging because uh, we have this local initiative in California called CHART where hospitals were collecting a lot of data for public, re public reporting. And for most of you know that the burden of doing data collection and data submission is not trivial. And so we were worried that people were going to push back. But by the first six to nine months, we'd actually developed a fair amount of camaraderie and a whole bunch of momentum until people said, yeah, let's share, share the data. And so we started collecting data uh, that uh, was as a port of 206 for that. And we used the national benchmark from NHSN for where we thought we were. Most of our hospitals were average had not been working on this, any of these topics before the 100,000 Lives campaign, and we thought well, it was pretty safe to use that as an assumption. But it is an assumption. We don't have a baseline, and we make some assumptions on that. But you can see from this graph, this is the median of hospitals. And our, we basically have, on a regular basis, except for a couple little bumps, half the hospitals or more are at zero. And what I don't have on here, because it makes it kind of complicated, is that our 75th percentile and our mean have dropped dramatically. So the 75th percentile is now below one per thousand uh, ventilator days, and uh, we really have made substantial progress. We think that we've, we've just about got 85 to 90 percent of the potential improvement out of uh, ventilator associated pneumonia that we've been able to get using the vent bundle and this whole notion of collaboration. This compares nicely with an NHSN data in this as well, so we're definitely ahead of the national game. We did have, there was no publicly reported good comparison for VAP in, in our local area or in something that we could use on a more regular basis. But we do have, through this chart initiative, um, the bundle elements. So three of the four bundle elements for VAP is publicly reported in California. And so we were able to make comparisons with Beacon and non-Beacon California hospitals on the process measures. And this graph, kind of complicated, kind of a busy slide, but if you look at the two graphs, You'll see 2007 and 2008 on the left for both Beacon and non-Beacon California hospitals. And both of them showed an improvement, but the uh, Beacon improvement was greater. So on the right, you can see the magnitude of the improvement, a 10.5% relative improvement uh, over uh, the year and a 6% improvement, relative improvement for uh, the non-Beacon hospitals. And those are statistically significant both for the improvement because we had enough sample size and Beacon is being um, statistically more than the non-Beacon hospital. So we think that this is some, you know, 
the emergence of an evidence that, in fact, the collaborative process is better than just letting natural diffusion happen with public reporting and the other activities going on in California. Here's our data for central line bloodstream infections. This one we got down pretty quickly. In fact, by the time we started collecting data, most of our hospitals said they'd gotten to zero pretty quickly. And several of them were very, very high when we first started doing this by self-report. But as we actually captured and standardized and worked on this definition, we were able to get our rates, again, deep and median down to zero. And again, our 76% now is well below one per 1,000 line days on this one as well. So we're doing very, very well. This compares nicely with the Michigan Keystone Project and also with some of the national data in HSN. I think we're, uh, you know, again, further evidence that the collaborative works in both VAP and central line bloodstream infections. And we've made an attempt to try to put these in more concrete terms, and we share this and use these as ways to try to, again, motivate the folks. So we've estimated the number of infections based on a baseline rate, um, and we think we've saved around 2,100, over 2,100 uh, central line and VAP infections. And based on some estimates in the literature, we think that's around almost 600 lives saved. So there are 600 people walking around in the Bay Area over the three and a half, four years that we've been working for these two initiatives in particular that we have data for that would not have been otherwise. And the way I look at it is I tell people I, I work for a Hallmark. I'm a Hallmark card salesman because all those 594 people are out there buying bat mitzvah cards, wedding cards, uh, graduation cards. They're going to birthdays, and all those folks need cards, and so we work for Hallmark to try to keep them going in the Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area. Here's a slide that demonstrates the biggest project that we've been working on over the past several years. We started it basically, um, we started our implementation in, in 2007, but really ge geared it up in 2008 and then turned it up even another notch in 2009. And we've shown since quarter one oh eight a 29% relative reduction in mortality in, in sepsis, severe sepsis. This builds on the uh, surviving sepsis campaign work that was done through the international um, group that, that developed surviving sepsis, came and, uh, surviving sepsis campaign and the IHI, and it's been buffeted by multiple more grants to the health systems and other areas other in the San Francisco Bay Area to work on this. We actually think this is the number one form of preventable death in all of the hospitals throughout the country. We've got some data to suggest that uh, we did that. And when we look at the number of lives saved, and we just do this since quarter one away, so it's two years worth of data, we have a thousand lives saved. It's dwarfed already the number of lives saved from ventilator associated pneumonia and central line bloodstream infections. And we actually are doing a more sophisticated lives saved analysis. We think this number is well over a thousand uh, patients that have been, you know, now alive based on the great work that the people in the Bay Area are doing on this. Uh, so this is one that we hope spreads to other areas, and we're going to be sharing our data broadly with this. Hospital-acquired pressure ulcers is a, another unique topic that we've been working on, and we've got, again, really good data. This is one of the best data elements because we now have a comparative. This was data that's also published using the CalMoc methodology at our chart um, uh, initiative for California. So we have uh, over 220 beacon and non-beacon hospitals that are giving us uh, hospital-acquired pressure ulcer data, and we're able to show some comparison. And you can see we had a 51% relative reduction since Q407. That was the first quarter that we had four uh, quarters worth of data. So these are rolling, rolling 12 months worth of data. And you can see our, our mean now is around 2%. We have about seven hospitals that are below 1%, um, below 1%. And the interesting thing, and this is what I was going to talk about, uh, I mentioned earlier, if you look in the literature, those, those data cannot be found. If you look at the evidence-based practices, you don't see major statistically significant improvement in outcomes um, on hospital-acquired thresholds on many of the practices, so turning and moisture applications and those different things. There is some data on beds, although most of our hospitals did not buy some of the extensive beds that are out there. Some did and some didn't. We think that a lot of this has to do with, you know, just attention to detail. A lot of frontline nurses who are nurse champions now have made an incredible amount of effort to do this on each shift that many of the hospitals that are under 1%. There are at least two champions per unit to make sure that they're looking at these cases. Every failure, any case that becomes a hospital-acquired pressure ulcer has intense scrutiny. And so there's been a great attention to detail and, and uh, regular practices that we think have driven that. And there's really not a lot of literature support for many of those uh, practices in the, in the meantime. So this is one of those things where maybe experience and um, the gray literature is going to start teaching us a little bit more about how to make these things happen. But we're really excited about this and it resulted in 450 fewer patients with pressure ulcers over the time that we've been collecting the data. So, again, while it's not life saved, it's really dramatic, especially for those folks that have had third and fourth degree pressure, fourth degree stage pressure ulcers 
uh, to uh, be able to go home without the difficulties that they would otherwise uh, be attributing those. And here again, we're able to look at the beacon versus the non-beacon, and we looked at 2007 versus 2008. We're hopeful to get the 2009 comparison in about three months. Uh, but you can see there was a statistically significant improvement both in beacon and non-beacon hospitals, but the beacon hospital was more than twice the improvement. It was 29% reduction compared to 11% non-reduction, I mean non-beacon reduction in pressure ulcers. And we think, again, this is strong evidence that public reporting is useful, but getting people together to share how they're actually implementing these practices and reducing it, developing a regional you know, goal to be able to reduce pressure ulcers has made a significant difference in the process. So again, we think there's something about collaboration that's just not regular diffusion. And while we haven't put our fingers exactly on it from a research statistical standpoint, we think again there's a growing body of evidence based on our experience to show that this makes a difference. A couple more slides on what we're working on now. C. difficile infection, uh, we think in four quarters not on here for 2009, but we think that we've saved about 165 uh, fewer C. difficile infections and, and that's about a 29% relative reduction. And uh, birth trauma and stroke in the same area for catheresis, a urinary tract infection, we think we say 60 of those. And uh, P. myocardial infarction, interesting, the, one of the more um, highly sought after and worked on quality initiatives. We've made some improvement on that, but it's so interesting because the numbers are small. There's not a lot of room for uh, real mortality reduction with AMI. So again, all of these are outcomes oriented. These aren't process measures, including falls with injury. And we see, we've seen improvement in all of these areas. And we'd love to be able to look at these on a comparative basis to see that there's been real change compared to uh, non-beacon performing hospitals. When you take our summary results and look them all together, you can you can see it on this slide. And let me make it a little bit easier. Um, we say, uh, and we, by name, the, the 37 hospitals in the Bay Area that have done all this hard work, we estimate that they saved over 1,593 lives. And that's because we are still calculating how many stroke lives that we saved. Um, uh, through the improvement in stroke uh, mortality reduction. Uh, but at least six, around 1,600 people in, in the five years we've been working on have been impacted in the Bay Area. About 2,400 infections and about 450 uh, patients with pressure ulcers. Pretty significant improvement in, in morbidity and mortality. And if we had the data to be able to show it with medication management, we think similar kinds of improvement has happened. It's just hard to capture um, serious outcomes measures improvement in that area, and so we don't have great ways to be able to display that. But again, there was a fair amount of work on med rec and on high-risk medications. So with that, I think, Heather and Megan, I'll stop, and I'll see if anybody has any questions, and we'll go back to a Q&A session and be happy to share uh, more ideas if people are interested. Okay, great. Well, then this time I'm going to unmute the phone lines, um, and please feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Oh, that's um, the that's part. But. Everyone's lines are um, open right now, so please be aware of that. I'm sorry, can we mute ourselves? You can mute yourself from your own phone, yeah. Okay, what number? Is that star one? Uh, um, I'm not sure. I think you would need a mute button on your... Oh, on my own phone. Okay, thanks. <laughs> We're still hearing someone in the background. I'm sorry. I'd okay. like to do a Q&A question, too. We're happy to do it if you want to just type it in the, in the chat room and chat area. We can answer those as well. Maybe I'll ask a question if that's okay. Um, has anybody, I mean, we've been talking with lots of folks across the country. Has anybody been working or able to develop what they feel confident with our outcomes measures on medication management? That might be a topic that we would be very interested in learning to see if we could uh, apply some of those techniques and, and approaches to some of the work that we've done. Um, I'll answer for the Ingrid program and give folks a chance to pull themselves off mute. We have um, a couple of projects that were looking at medication management from different perspectives. Um, uh, Dr. Flynn at Rutgers University 
was looking at nursing structures and processes on medication errors um, and, and noted a, uh, that she found a lot of, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the words I want to use. She found a lot in the conversations she had with nurses, uh, interruptions was a major uh, factor of something they had to, to work into their schedule, actually, that they had to kind of plan for when they were going to be interrupted because it happens so frequently. Um, and they also looked at the economic impact of non-intercepted errors uh, and, and uh, in order to make a business case for evidence-based recommendations. And their findings um, are available on the inquiry website. I can provide that link to people in a moment um, if they're interested. We actually have a, a research brief that kind of synthesizes a bunch of findings, and I'll make that available to all of you. Um, we also have a group that was looking at the nursing pharmacist collaboration on how you reconcile medication at home, you know, after discharge, and what they were finding of, you know, what patients were being recommended to take versus what they actually took, which was uh, a very interesting study as well. And then we have one group that's still in the midst of their work, and they are finishing at the end of the summer. <laughs> you know, outside of the hospital uh, focused on empowering home care nurses to resolve medication discrepancies. So that's an example of some of the work that we funded associated with this. Um, and let me find this link and I'll get it up to everybody. I'm going to put this in the chat bar. Uh, it's a link that if you're interested in, in it's under the results section of the inquiry website. Um, that you can actually download it. Yeah. Are there any other questions, either for Bruce or from from Bruce? This has been a really uh, interesting session. I'm so glad you included the uh, pressure ulcer song. I was I actually sent it to Megan a week ago and said I hope he includes this in his presentation. Yes, about it's a couple more minutes if you want to, folks want to go to the website. And again, Ed, if you want to include it on the inquiry website, I can give you the full version and you can. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Put it with this uh, recording. That'd be great. Wonderful. Actually, I think, Megan, do you have that? I think I sent it to you, right? Didn't I? Yep, I have it. Okay, great. So, Heather, I'll send that to you. We'll also post the recording on the call. Great. Great. Well, wonderful. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for, for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. It's such an interesting. Um, collaborative effort, and I really appreciate you sharing it with us. And, uh, you know, I, I always make the offer, if anyone uh, is walking away from the session and, you know, a thought occurs to you later or a question occurs to you later that you'd like us to pass along to Bruce, we're happy to do that. So I'm going to throw my email address up here, and you can always uh, reach out to me with any questions you might have. And that's it. I think I'll just thank you very much for your time, everyone. So, no, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.